come up the same. I know that that mycelial sheath is always different microscopically than the mycelium in the body, so I was just curious if anybody had done any sequencing on that. No, we really should, though. Um, yeah. I brought this one back, so we, put, we still have this sheath on there. Oh, cool. So, um, yeah, I'm going to get into the lab. I'll see if I can do that. So this one was pretty delicious. There's a lot of romarias, like over 100 species of romarias in Mexico. About half of them are bitter. So if they're not bitter, I fry them up and they're good. Romarias me has Clodophilus. Mm -hmm. has so these really cool, uh, kind of like anastomizing gills here. So I think it's the amount of these gills a little bit of it raw. Uh -huh. And if it's bitter, yeah. don't eat it. It's yep. easy to go ahead. And if it's bitter, you can still eat it. It just tastes really bad. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, a lot of Chinese food recipes call for bitter ingredients, so if you pick the right recipe, it might be really good. <clears throat> and here's kind of a tropical polypore. These are super common when you get down near the ocean. <coughs> and this, I never figured out what it is. And it's really cool, really unique, never saw it again. I collected it, and now I can't find it, so maybe yeah. one day it'll turn up. Did you look at the spores, okay. or...? No, I haven't done any work on it. Uh, I just dried it in the bag, and <coughs> there it remains. What do the gills look like? They're about the same color as the mushroom. <coughs> uh, if you go to Mushroom Observer, you can see a, a nice uh, close-up of the gills. I don't think I have it in this talk. But yeah, exactly the same color, which leads me to believe that it's white spore. Although entheloma is also possible, mm -hmm. but I've never seen an entheloma with gills like that, so I'm thinking like tetrosity or something really weird I've never heard of. <coughs> but this is where the sequencing can really help, because if you have no idea what it is, sometimes you can pinpoint it really fast. And even with the microscopy, with these weird tropical genera, sometimes you'll be running in circles for years until you sequence it, and then you're like, oh yeah, now it all makes sense. Well, we were thinking about it, or the right now again. You can see it's killing the leaf there. Uh, but really pretty cool looking. And this is really cool under the microscope too. Bright purple KOH. What creates the pattern? That's a good question. I don't know why the pattern is like that. It's always very concentric. Yeah. It's probably kind of like a fairy ring um, in the forest where the uh, fungus starts in the middle and then expands out and makes fruiting bodies. And this one is really cool. This one has crusate spores, which means the spores are in the form of a plus or a cross, which is something that's very rare and only, only seen in the gen genus Trichylosporum. And then this Hypholoma lateridium, common <coughs> uh, edible Hypholoma, it's known from the East Coast. And this Inosibi, um, the one in the right has really boring spores, <coughs> kind of shaped like beans. But the one on the left has these awesome star-shaped spores. Mm -hmm. So inosibes are some of the most boring mushrooms to look at, but under the microscope, inosibes are some of the most interesting mushrooms you can possibly see. Mm -hmm. And then this lepsinum rugosipes, super delicious. Um, to name that, because the cap is rugose, all pitted and bumped. And this is not even a fungus, it's a slime mold. So it's kind of related to amoebas and stuff like that. But trichia decipiens always looks really cool in the macro lens. These were about a millimeter tall. And then Entheloma morei always photographs well. Not uncommon in the cloud forests. And these were super tiny. Um, you can see the next slide. There's a, yeah, there's a peso. Oh, wow. So that's about the size of a dime. And then, <laughs> yeah, they're like a millimeter across each. Um, but with a macro lens, even tiny mushrooms can look really cool. Mm -hmm. And then here's a cordyceps that grows off of wasps. Mm -hmm. And there's one tree in Mexico which has about 30 of these right under the tree. And I haven't found it anywhere else. And we've looked for a long time. But it's just only that one tree. Mm -hmm. And this kind of cordyceps only grows on wasps. And then Deflexula kind of looks like Heresium, but it's, it's kind of tough, like a polypore. And Isaria tenua piece. Um, it's probably actually should be a cordyceps, because I think it's the same kind of fungus as a cordyceps, just a different stage. But if you touch this, these clouds of spores fly off, and if they land on bugs, then um, they probably grow there or something. <laughs> and 
Anthorhina spinosima is uh, maybe really belongs in Mycena. Nope. But, no? Nope. It's a real genus. It's a good genus, yeah. Okay. Anthorhina spinosima is a good genus. They're really cool looking. This is tiny. Uh, this is about half a centimeter across. But this fly here only uh, lays, on, it's like one of those fungus ones that only lays eggs in uh, mushrooms. And then Phallus enthusianus is kind of an interesting one. It's pretty rare. I've only seen it two or three times. Um, but the top smells really, really sweet, like nauseatingly sweet. It doesn't quite smell bad, but it almost is like too sweet. And then the neck down below smells like rotten meat. Um, but I've noticed that women have a very different opinion of the odor of this. So when I found this, I was with a couple ladies, and I said, um, que olor tienes, and handed it to them. And they said that the top smelled really dulce, like sweet, but not like nauseating, like they really liked it. And it, they just kept smelling it and smelling it over and over because I thought it smelled awesome. And then the bottom, they said it smelled like chemicals, but it didn't smell repulsive to them. And to me, it was this like terrible rotting meat smell, but they just kept smelling it. They're like, oh, that's, that's kind of interesting. <laughs> Did you try it with other males and females, or was it? There was only two people there, and, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it have been something specific. I think I've, I've asked a few people now, and I think my sample size is around four, and usually, um, yeah. So you're getting pretty accurate. Yeah, I know. I've only been like realizing this for about a year, but yeah, usually the um, the men just hate the distinct corns all the time, and women hate distinct corns like half the time. Okay. And I think it's species dependent too. Um, this is a really good edible. Ovaria delphis truncatus. And then this is not a mushroom, this is a plant, Heliosus canescens, but it's a uh, mycopedotrophic, so it feeds on mushroom mycelium, and that's why it doesn't need any chlorophyll. Can you say that right again? Like, Mycohedero... Let's see, it's, uh, I don't know. Mycoheterotrophic? No, I don't even know if that's a word. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's a word. Yeah, basically it's a parasite on the mycelium. So it takes all of its carbons and sugars from the mycelium, and th then it doesn't need to be green. <coughs> but I've seen this a few times. They always photograph really well. So the flowery one. How large is that? <laughs> this one was about five inches tall. Okay. Yeah. Does anyone yeah. know what it uh, parasitizes or uh, what what fungal species? No, I don't know what it? this eats. Ah, okay. I'll buy a paper on it somewhere. And then this Clathrus crispus. Um, it smells like rotten meat. This is a tropical species. And then Heresia marinaceus is super delicious. And I always find this on oak. And Chrysophilina. Uh, these are really tiny, but really cool looking. And then in Mexico, there's a lot of undescribed species of chanterelles. I don't think they have any described species of chanterelles. There's probably a couple names that apply from the East Coast. Uh, most of them are undescribed. So I brought back a whole lot of chanterelles and sent them all to Matthew Fultz. And then Dicephalospora rufocornea, so this little ascomycete. And when I found it, I had no idea what it was, but I scoped it and put it up in Asco, France. And they're able to identify it. Now that I know what it looks like, I see it all over the place. But I guess it's super rare or something because I'm the only person that has a mushroom observer. And then these geranemas, occasionally a bioluminescent. This one wasn't. But you can see that I took this photo with the flash, but there's no <coughs> harsh shadow behind the stem. So this was definitely a ring flash, which make it, makes it look really nice. <coughs> Also with the ring flash, Clavulinopsis, Arantio cinnabarana. And then here's the Mexican candy cap. I'm not sure if it's the same as the East Coast candy cap, but it's not <coughs> nearly as strong as our West Coast candy cap. But it does smell like maple syrup. I got some really big collections of this. And if you get enough of them, they, they can work in desserts and stuff. But it's still better um, to get the rubidus here. And it's kind of interesting because these are mycorrhizal, but they're always growing directly from sticks and leaves and leaf litter. But always under oaks. 
So I brought a little bit back, and the nice people over at Humboldt State University let me use their scanning electron microscope. And it's kind of cool, because with regular microscopes, the depth of field is really narrow. But with electrons, you get a really wide depth of field. So you can see it's in focus here on the top, and it's in focus on the back. It's kind of in focus everywhere. And then the limit to light microscopy is about a thousand times magnification. Anything about that is just salespeople um, trying to sell you microscopes. <laughs> but with electrons, they're a lot tinier than photons, or at least uh, you know, the photon waves. So you can get a lot more magnification. So here's uh, 1,900 times. And you can see the, the spores of the candy cap are really reticulate. So they have these uh, reticulate walls across them. And then at 4,000 times, and then here's the scleroderma. These look pretty cool, but they're kind of poisonous. <laughs> kind of open in the purple inside, unless they're really young. If they're and white, are they poisonous? What's that? If they're white? Yeah, they are. It's still yeah, sometimes you cut open the scleroderma and it's pure white because it's really young. Yeah. But it's still a lot harder than all those edible puffballs. Mm -hmm. So they're like rock solid, oh. especially when they're really young like that. But yeah, it's not true that all the puffballs that are white inside are edible, just because of the sclerodermis. And then Oroscopium vulgari always photographs well. This was about a centimeter across, it's growing on Douglas fir cones. Do they grow only on Douglas fir cones? I see them in uh, pine needles sometimes too, like uh, fir duff and all sorts of pine yeah, needle duff. Fine, uh, but um, in the Bay Area, I usually find them at fir cones. Uh, sugar pine cones too. Yeah. Yeah. And I've sequenced those sugar pine ones from the Sierras, and they're the same as the uh, as the coastal ones, but they're different than the European ones, and they're very different than the Japanese ones. Uh, Lactaria salmonicolor. I tacked the name group on here because this is a name from Europe, and the Mexican species is totally different. But this is really common, pretty good edible in the high elevation fir forests. And then Lactarius indigo is super popular. Wow. They like to eat them. All the Mexicans call them azules. <laughs> and if there's one edible mushroom they know, it'll be this one. <coughs> and a lot of people like to break them open, and then this really blue paint comes out, and they use it as watercolor paint. Is it uh, mycorrhizal? Yeah, it's mycorrhizal, usually with oak, but I did find it under pure pine as well. And they have some really cool entolomas in Mexico. Um, this one was about eight inches tall, and it was way down in a valley, so I had to do an eight-second exposure to get this photo, because there was hardly any light down there. Where in Mexico are you? This is Oaxaca. Yeah, this was about 20 miles from Guadalupe de Jimenez. But these pictures were all over, but I usually like to go around the south of Mexico, because the south is safer than the north, um, and the mushrooms are more interesting, and it's kind of more authentic. Because it's more rainforesty? Yeah, it's, uh, it gets better rain in the south. You know, the north is almost a little bit like Texas, um, which is cool. You know, there's cool mushrooms in Texas, too. But in the south, it's just like completely different stuff that you've never seen before. And in the north, it's kind of more familiar stuff. But really cool stem texture on the central area. And then this is the world's largest lacaria, Lacaria nobilis. They can be a foot tall sometimes. And they're pretty common under oak commonly eaten too. And then this is a Poronia. These are pretty cool. They grow on cow manure. And this particular one looks like a shower head. I also have some other Poronias that had a hemispherical cap. Are they gills? No, no gills. The spores come out of the top, those pores in the, the very top there. Is it an ASCO? I think so, but I haven't scoped it yet, so I don't know for sure. But I, yeah, I think it is. Oh, yeah, yeah. What's the size of it? About two inches tall. Oh. Yeah. Are those wet or are they slimy? I took this picture in the rain. Okay. Yeah. And when, when they're dry, they're not slimy at all. Edible? Um, they're really tough. They're very woody. Um, but I brought them back, so I'm going to do some work on them pretty soon. Oh. Cool. And then here is Eustilago Medes. Uh, common name is corn smut or huilacoche. And so this is a parasite that grows on corn. And sometimes when I'm walking through cornfields, I'll find one ear that's is way too big, and it'll be parasitized with this. But this is really popular, and it's super delicious. It tastes a lot like corn, but it has some other flavor, kind of sort of like cheesy, cheese-like too. Yeah, so traditionally it's used in, um, 
in quesadillas. Um, but I also like to fry it up and put it on tostadas and put it in enchiladas and stuff like that. Uh, but it's really good. And in the United States, you can only find it canned, and it's not really worth getting when it's canned. It's really only good when it's fresh. Is it commonly available in the market? It's super common in the further south you go in Mexico. Oh. And so these were only a dollar each for a big old corn husk full of it. Wow. And so, yeah, so when that's I see it, I buy actually in market right there, huh? Yeah, this is in the market. Okay. It doesn't grow like that. <laughs> no. No, it just looks like a regular corn plant, except that the ear is huge and deformed and bulging. But you can take these. I, I, I brought a bunch of these before I left and put them in a the dehydrator and brought them back. And now when I grow corn, I can just take the powdered um, you know, mushroom and kind of sprinkle it on the corn silk and grow my own here. Is it carried wow. in the soil itself once it becomes yeah. established? I don't know how it gets carried, but I think so. Yeah, it's I know it's waterborne. I've uh, cut waterborne? corn plants before, uh, just like slice it. I guess that's the traditional thing to do. And I've gotten corn smut on my corn that way. Oh, cool. Yeah. You can actually sometimes find it in the farmer's markets, but you'll have to ask them. Yeah, that's that's a rare thing, but it's um, definitely worth purchasing if you see it. It's super good. ¿Cómo se dice en español? Huilacoche is what they call it. Huilacoche. It starts with an H, but their H's are silent. So it's like H-U-I-L. You got another hour, Alan? Just keep going. Just kidding. <laughs> no, um, no, Mark, I'll, um, if you could maybe wrap it up soonish. Okay. Uh, that would be great. You're, I mean, it's all good. If you go a little over, mm -hmm. but we're um, getting to be where we need to go to the next slideshow. Okay, well, just Thanks. stop me when I'm out of time because um, we'll just I, keep going. I have a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, why don't you try to wrap it up in 10 or 15? You can run a little over. Yeah, sounds good. But, yeah, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, corn syrup smut is super delicious. And here's the fungus fair in Michoacan. And this 